in this audience, so <laughs> this feels really strange. Um, I'm actually really nervous and excited to be here um, and happy to share this research that I've been toiling away at now for a couple of years. Um, it's time I got some feedback. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming tonight, especially since we had this little slick of nastiness cover everything in the middle of the day. Um, I'm in the process of writing this research up, um, but I don't want to really pre present a formal paper. The paper, by the way, is also getting very long, and I've, I've hacked this back, and I'm probably going to talk a little bit longer than I really like to. Um, I've divided this talk for, uh, for speaking purposes into six parts. Where I'm coming from, what I wanted to know, what I did, what I found, what I think it means, and what comes next. OK, where am I coming from? Well, I'm coming from Rokeby Museum, but barely. It was pretty icy there this afternoon. Most of you probably know that Rokeby is a National Historic Landmark Underground Railroad historic site and one of the few uh, public history sites in the state that interprets black history. If you've visited, you know that our house tour tells the stories of fugitive slaves that were sheltered by the Robinson family in the 1830s and 1840s. Um, <clears throat> many of our visitors wonder, when, we're ha when we have them on tours, what it was like for those fugitives when they came into Vermont, a very white state and very unlike the places that they came from. And frankly, we wonder too. We talk about it a lot. Um, <clears throat> Actually, we wonder what Vermont was like for all of its black residents. So I decided a couple of summers ago that it was time we gave our visitors a more informed answer, and I set out on this project. OK, what did I want to know? Anything and everything. I wanted to know what life was like for black Vermonters in the 19th century. Um, to what extent were they integrated into community life, given that they constituted a very small portion of the total population and that racism was widespread? Did they own their own homes and farms? Were they able to marry and raise families? Um, in fact, we wondered about this issue of marriage. Several of the fugitives, in fact, most of the fugitives who were harbored at our site were young males, and they mostly moved on. And we often wondered if their grim marriage prospects uh, contributed to that decision. Um, were their children educated in local schools? Did they vote in town meeting? Did they belong to the local churches? Those are some of the questions I was hoping to answer. OK, what did I do? Well, I began by carving out a manageable area, Addison County, where the museum is located. But because my perspective was Rokeby-centric, and it really is essentially Rokeby-centric, I added the Chittenden County towns of um, <clears throat> Charlotte and Hinesburg. And a lot of people don't really know where that, where that line is. They think we're in Charlotte or whatever. But they're very, they're very close. Um, and obviously, people involved at Rokeby, living at Rokeby, living in Ferrisburg, would be much more likely to have interactions with people from Charlotte and Hinesburg than from, say, Shoreham or Bridport or Orwell, very far south in Addison County. Um, a county is a nice jurisdiction. It makes a certain kind of logical sense. But I really wanted to um, keep that Rokeby-centric um, perspective. I set my time frame, 1790 to 1860, for a fairly traditional one. Um, and I turned for information to the usual public uh, sources, beginning with the federal census. It supplied the basic data that became my universe for this project. Now, 19th century censuses are notorious for errors in undercounting, and I found errors in undercounting myself. But really, they're what we've got. It's kind of our tough luck that they aren't better. Um, and I gathered all of my data from those um, censuses. I analyzed that data in some, into some tables. And my friend George, in the second row, is going to hand them out. <laughs> this is the great thing about knowing everyone in the audience. <laughs> um, I, I, I pulled together um, population data by household type, number of independent households, and total population for each town for every census. And I put it into, into table format, because that's the easiest way to present it and read it and sort of understand it. Um, from that, I created a roster of every black independent household in Addison County, Charlotte, and Hinesburg from 1790 to 1860. It's 104 names. Then I began to search for these men, women, and families. Armed with my list, I hit the town halls. <laughs> 
Um, community life in Antebellum, Vermont was, took place at the level of the town, both privately and publicly. And town clerks recorded all manner of town and private business. Well, that's the theory, at least. Um, there was pretty lax record keeping in most of the town halls that I um, visited. And then, of course, many of these documents have been lost over the years since they were first kept. They leave a, quite a patchwork that can be really frustrating. But still, I have to say, I was surprised at how much information I was able to find. Two other sources uh, that I wanted to use were church and probate records also proved difficult. Um, church records are, can also be great gold mines of information about not just church membership, but marriage and birth and death and baptisms. But they're kept by local congregations, and it's not usually the first item on a local congregation's to-do list is to keep those records. And then finally, a fire in the Addison County Courthouse in 1852, <laughs> Elsa is smiling, <laughs> uh, means that probate court records are very, uh, mostly gone also. And that really, uh, as a, somebody who deals in objects, that's really um, sad for me because I think probate records tell you a great deal. Looking at that material culture of what was in people's homes, you get really good insight into family life and relationships and occupation and um, domestic life, and those are virtually non-existent. Um, OK, now, what did I find in all of this um, searching? Um, First, let me say again that fragmentary records notwithstanding, I found a lot of facts. I mean, I amassed a lot of information. I was surprised at how much is really out there. Um, I just hope I can convey it in a way that makes sense. I've arranged my findings into two parts. And first is the um, tables that have been passed around to you. And I'm not really going to dwell on those. I wanted to just hand them to you um, so you can see. Um, the one on the first page is the overall. The censuses go across the top. The towns go down the side. Some Addison County towns had no black residents at any time in any of the censuses. They're not on the list. Um, it gives you white households, independent black households. It gives you totals at the bottom. And if you look across the bottom, you'll see here those subtotal lines. You'll see that um, the number of African Americans increased um, in Addison County increased at every census. Um, especially in the early years when the state's population was also increasing exponentially. But it peaked at 117 in 1820, which isn't a lot of people. And if you look at the very bottom, where I've also added in Charlotte and Heinsberg, you'll see that it peaked at 161 a decade earlier. Now, black residents were not evenly dispersed throughout the county. Um, only three Addison County towns, Ferrisburg, Middlebury, and Virgins, counted black residents in every census. And together, these three towns account for the majority of the aggregate number of African Americans um, in the county during the period. If you add Bristol, which had a significant population later in the period, the four towns account for two thirds of the total population of African Americans during the period. So they, were, they tended to not to be evenly dispersed around. And Charlotte and Heinsberg also had fairly substantial black populations with African Americans counted in virtually every census. Um, as a proportion of the population statewide, uh, black Vermonters never accounted for half a percent. But that, that, that isn't also, again, it's not evenly distributed. It wasn't like there was a same percentage everywhere and, and not even in Addison County. Um, the distribution varied widely. In 1790, African Americans made up 7% of the residents of Virgins and 2.5% of those in Ferrisburg. Now, these relatively high percentages are partly artifacts of the small population at that early date. And that's something that you really have to keep in mind when you're working with small numbers and trying to do percentages. Virgins only had 200 people in 1790, so 7% of 200 is not a lot of people. Um, and although it started high, the percentage of, of African Americans in Virgins declined at every census from 7 to 5 to 3 to 2 and finally to 1% in 1860 because the white population started to increase. Middlebury provides a really interesting counterpoint because Middlebury and Virgins tended to have the largest, those two towns had the largest black population throughout. But the um, proportion, the percentage of African Americans in Middlebury never even reached 1% because it had such a much larger white population. The largest it ever had was 0.9%. That was in 1820, and the population of Middlebury was 2,500. 
three times the size of the population of Virgins. African Americans living in white households, this is Africa, I've been talking about those in independent households, those who were living in white households were not recorded by name until 1850, um, so many remain untraceable. Um, we get some sense of who they are from the aggregate data, however, and if you turn on the second page, there's a little table at the top. Um, that's where I put that together, and I just tell you that it's there, and I'm not going um, to dwell on it. I, I'll answer questions about this. This is the most boring part. <laughs> uh, if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, now I'm going to go on to the more interesting part where I, I really found out some in, uh, facts about these folks' lives. I started with property and occupation. Um, land was the great attraction of Vermont um, at the end of the 18th century, and it drew thousands um, from southern New England. Addison County was particularly attractive because it had um, very fertile soils, so the sons of uh, farmers in the southern New England who were not going to inherit land came flooding up into Vermont. Um, the majority of these rural white, white New Englanders acquired property and established farms. That's what they came up to do. They succeeded in that. And I wondered what happened to the African Americans who came along that great tide. Um, some black households owned property throughout the period. In every census, there were, was at least one um, black property owner. And the number increased at every census. But the highest percentage of landowners, 56% of all African American households in 1850 and 1860 owned their own homes or farms, was less than the rate among whites, naturally. Um, and not surprisingly, the black landowners were also concentrated in the towns with the largest black population. Charlotte, with one, with one critical exception, Charlotte, Ferrisburg, Hinesburg, Panton, and Virgins all had several black property owners. Middlebury, on the other hand, the county's largest town and the commercial center, had exactly one black property owner from 1790 to 1860, or I should probably say one that I could find. There may be another one in there somewhere, but I found exactly one, which was, I thought, very surprising. Now, many of you are familiar with Elise Guyette's work on the Clark and Peters families in um, Heinsburg. And when Schubel Clark purchased 100 acres um, in Heinsburg in 1795, he established a farm that his extended family would occupy until the Civil War. The Clarks were joined later by Prince Peters, uh, who purchased a lot nearby in 1824, and also put down roots for his children and grandchildren. A third black farmer, Primus Storms, purchased land first in Heinsburg and then in neighboring Panton. These three men and their descendants accounted for the majority of black landowners in Addison County, Charlotte, and Heinsburg during this period. I want to take a closer look for a minute at the extended Storms family, because you're going to hear quite a lot about them tonight. Um, they were former slaves from New York. Primus and Pamelia Storms had eight children. OK, now for the trick, folks. I've already forgot what to do. The one that you want their pictures? There. Primus, can you hear me if I don't talk into this thing? Primus Storms purchased what you might call the 100% corner in Panton, if Panton had such a thing. Um, you can see the location of his farm. That's, uh, that road comes out of Regenz. The Panton Road comes out of Regenz and goes to the lake. You can, can you see the Peace Storms with the arrow? That was a farm um, that the family owned. Um, Now, I want to go to, if you look at this inset, you'll see Miss Storm. Um, this is from the 1871 Beers Atlas, and I think this is probably one of Primus's daughters-in-law. Um, I'm quite sure that all of his female children were dead by 1871. If you look at the school at the corner, school number four, the land that that school sits on was leased to the town of Panton by Primus and Pamelia's daughter, Susanna. It's a beautiful stone building. It's a little house right now. In between the two um, is the Methodist Church, that big green square. Um, that is today the Panton Town Hall. That land for the, that that church was built on was donated by Primus and Pamelia's son, Henry. So the Storms family had quite a bit to do with the center of Panton. 
a handful of these early um, African American families lived on and worked their own farms. According to Jeffrey Potash's definition of a subsistence farm for an Addison County family of five, these black landowners all built viable farms. And there's some information on the third table. It's the bottom of the second page. Um, most of them had more than the 15 to 25 improved acres that he specified, but they had less livestock, with one exception. Um, they had more cows, or fewer cows, horses, and pigs, but surprise, they had more sheep. Some raised significantly more sheep, indicating that they were participating in Vermont's thriving merino wool economy. They clearly opted to devote some effort to producing um, a crop for sale in the market. And if you look at Lewis Clark, for example, he had 65 sheep in 1834. That's a very small flock by Addison County standards, but it's 10 times the number needed for a subsistence farm. And it may also help to explain the value of his house. If you look, he had a house valued at $200, significantly more than anyone else on that list. Now, despite a clear pattern of farm ownership, these African-American men were rarely identified as farmers in the census. Um, in 1850 or 1860 when occupational information was included. Only Josephus Peters, Edwin Williams, and Louis Langley of Heinsburg and Prince King of Middlebury earned that designation, each of them only once. More often, the heads of these farming families were identified as farm laborers. This was a very interdependent economy and all but the wealthiest farmers traded work with each other, working sometimes as laborers on neighboring farms. And it's possible that these black men actually did spend more of their time laboring on others' farms than their own, but it's also very likely that prejudice was at work. Um, Prince King is a telling example, I think. He was clearly an independent farmer. He was identified as white in the 1860 census, and that was the one time he was identified as a farmer. In 1850, he was identified as black and a farm laborer, and in 1870, he was identified again as black and a farm laborer. So, Something funny going on there. Occupational information um, is very hard to come by. It's available for less than half. I found it for less than half of my uh, heads of household, um, it, which is a real limitation, but you go with what you can find. About a third of black household heads were listed as laborers, day laborers, or farm laborers. Now, the Robinson family, um, whose farm is today Ropey Museum, employed several African-American laborers. Um, their employment is recorded in account books in the museum's collection. And Mingo Niles, and I want to show you Mingo. Mingo and Phoebe Niles. Uh, Mingo Niles was associated with the Robinsons for 30 years and had charge of their vegetable garden every year. It's hard to know how precise these census occupation terms were. You know, day laborer, laborer, farm laborer. Day laborers worked at the most menial jobs and lived with the insecurity of a daily search for employment. Laborers may have worked by the day or on the farm, but probably had mill or factory jobs. And in the 1860 census, for example, six of the seven men listed as laborers lived in the industrial towns of Bristol and Virgins, where there were jobs in the mills, the tanneries, the other um, industries of the sort site of water power. And a few of these laborers seem to have made more than a subsistence living. Um, Primus and Pamelia Storms' sons, Philip and Joseph, for example, owned their homes in Virgins. Their brother John, on the other hand, was more marginally employed, quote, as a hewer of wood and a drawer of water. These were classic day laborer activities. This is according to his obituary. Um, his death notice also said that, described him as, quote, unfavorably situated for mental advancement, which may, I think he means he had some kind of a mental disability, which probably also was very, li very limiting for him. Three black heads of households were identified as mechanics or artisans of some sort. Um, Andrew Santee, for example, first appeared in the Bristol census in 1830 and four years later paid $300 for the property that included the trip hammer shop and privileges there too, being the shop that the said Santee now occupies. So Santee was not only a skilled artisan, but he was also able to purchase the shop that he worked in and the home that went with it. He was in the Bristol census again in 1840, after selling off some of his property. It was described as a house lot. He sold it in 1838. And then in 1850, he's gone. So despite having a trade and owning his own business, he was not um, 
uh, very long lived in the area. Now, a few young men who were not yet heads of their own households worked in other occupations um, that may have offered a chance to rise above the level of unskilled laborer. Andrew and Joseph Storms, uh, two grandsons of Primus and Pamelia, were working in Virgenza's steamboat cooks in 1850. And their brother Philip was employed as a clerk for Charles Bradbury, who was a flour merchant in Virgenza. 21-year-old Abile Anthony worked as a barber in the R.W. Adams Hotel in Middlebury in 1860. And um, barbering is an occupation that was a signal for middle-class status for African Americans in the 19th century. Historians have documented how difficult it was for African Americans in the North to acquire the skills that would qualify them for good jobs. Um, because slaves performed all of the labor in the South, they were trained to do skilled as well as unskilled work. But Northern whites feared black workers, competition from black workers, and um, attempted often successfully to keep them out. This conflict played out primarily in the northern cities, but the few people listed with any kind of skilled occupations at all suggest to me that it may be evidence of how it played out even in rural Vermont. Now, 17 of those 104 heads of households in my long list um, were women. Only one female household head um, had her occupation listed, and that was Rachel Robinson of Virgins. And those of you who are familiar with rugby will know that we have a Rachel Robinson at rugby, too. Apparently pure coincidence that they had the same name. She worked as a domestic servant, no surprise there, as no doubt did probably many of the other women on that list. Mary Ann Henry, for example, uh, who was listed in the Charlotte census in 1850, worked for the Robinsons at Rugby, as did Phoebe Niles, uh, wife of Mingo Niles. And you can see Phoebe is up to her elbows in a laundry tub in that picture. One black woman attained what you could call a measure of success. Pamelia Storms, the youngest child of Primus and Pamelia, was counted in the Stevens Hotel in Virgins in 1850, and she worked there as a cook. The Virgins Vermonter described her, quote, as proverbially the best cook in all the region, and asserted that, quote, not a few of the choice dishes discussed at the Stevens Hotel were the result of her culinary experience and skill. Pamelia Storms also owned property. She inherited land um, in Panton when her father died in 1842, and she owned a house and for a short time two houses in Virgins. Several other uh, women owned property. Three of them were widows who inherited property um, when their husbands died. But there were a few others like Pamelia who were single, including Rachel Robinson. And now I'm going to find my East Street. Uh, this is a inset of Virgins. Maybe I'll just go here. Um, this is Main Street in Virgins, if you're familiar with Virgins. This is East Street. These are the two. F.E.W. F.E.W. is Freddie Woodbridge. He was uh, Rachel Robinson's employer. And when she died in 1864, she left Mary Woodbridge, Woodbridge her home. And right next door, you see it says Storms. That's where Philip Storms lived. Um, and his family, they were neighbors. She bought this house in 1834 and lived there for the next 30 years until her death. Okay, now, marriage and family. Uh, most black household heads in Addison County, Charlotte, and Heinsburg were married, about 70%. Still, finding a marriage partner was probably not easy um, in a community that had such a small African-American population and in which interracial marriage was officially taboo. Um, I have to wonder if the poor marriage prospects influenced some black Vermonters to move on and whether the inability to, to marry and, and form families not only resulted from but also contributed to the small population which actually also over time declined. An interesting bit of evidence turned up in a letter in the collection at Ropey. George Robinson, who was a son of the abolitionists, Rowland Thomas and Rachel Gilpin Robinson, wrote home from Savannah, Georgia in 1847. 22-year-old George had a message for Aaron Freeman, uh, an African-American who was then 19 years old and working as a farm laborer at Rogue B. George said, quote, tell Aaron I could get him a very nice wife here, either a little bit black, a good deal black, or as black as tars, we have all varieties. Now this passage suggests not only that Aaron was having trouble finding a young woman to court, but that it was a topic of conversation among Eric, Aaron, and George, and George's brother, to whom this letter was sent. These are three young men, ages 19 to their early 20s, working on the farm, 
talking about girl troubles. I'm happy to say that Aaron Freeman did find a wife, um, but not for 10 more years. He married Rachel Williams, the daughter of Edwin Williams, farmed in Heinsburg, in 1857. In 1857, he was 28 and she was 17. This uncommon difference in their ages, I think, um, also suggests, and her relative youth, I think, confirms the difficulty that some black Vermonters had in forming families. Now, some African Americans didn't find black marriage partners. Eight of the male heads of household in Addison County, Charlotte, and Hinesburg had white wives. Virgins, in particular, was home to two or three interracial families continuously from 1820 to 1860. William H. Howard and his wife Adeline had two children and owned their own home. They were in Virgins for a very short period of time. And the extended Storms family, with a total of six independent households in 1840, accounted for four, for half of the eight interracial marriages. All but one of Primus and Pamelia's five sons married white women. Only Philip, their second son, married a black woman. Her name was Rebecca, and that's just about all I can tell you about her. Now, Schubel and Viola Clark of Heinsberg had several daughters, Elmira, Phoebe, and Harriet, who might have made wives for the Storm sons. Obviously, marriage across communities was common and certainly even necessary. But Elmira Clark married William Langley of Rutland, um, which is even further than Virgins. And interestingly, Phoebe married Edwin Williams, who may have been a fugitive slave. And after she died, her sister Harriet married Edwin Williams. So there were no wives there for the Storm's boys. Um, the Lewis's, I mean, the Clark's youngest uh, child, Lewis, um, accounts for another one of the interracial marriages. His wife, Ruth Brown, was white. Now, although they were a minority, these interracial couples were not unique. Unlike some New England states, Vermont did not prohibit interracial marriage, and it was probably the inevitable result of a very small African-American population living among whites. According to James and Lois Horton, New England was unusual in the number of marriages between black men and white women, and all of the Addison County marriages were black men and white women, um, which suggests that African-American women may have had an even more difficult time finding um, marriage partners. Two of the Storms' daughters never married, and uh, Pamelia, the Stevens Hotel legendary cook, did not marry until 1857 when she was 45 years old, and her husband was 11 years younger than she was. Now, I've put uh, two or three different things together in a section that I call community and civic life as just a way to sort of group it, um, voting, school attendance, and church membership. Um, the franchise, um, of course, the proud mark of American citizenship was denied to African Americans um, in many northern states, but not in Vermont. Um, but I have to tell you that lists of voters, this was one of the things that surprised me, lists of voters in town hall records of the 19th century were really not well kept. Very rare and random did I find, regardless of color. Lists of, you know, you were sworn a freeman and you had the right to vote in town meeting, you don't find a lot of that. Now, Schubel Clark and his sons and son-in-laws did have their swearings in recorded in Heinsburg. Um, and four of Primus and Pamelia Storms' sons had similar uh, recordings in Virgins. Joseph, Philip, John, and Primus Storms Jr. all voted in Virgin's town meetings regularly from the 1830s until the 1850s. Um, Philip Storms actually not only voted, he was elected pound keeper twice in 1834 and 1835. John Jackson, who was a landowner, was uh, sworn a freeman in Charlotte in 1844, and Aaron Freeman was also sworn in in 1848. Officially, any black male head of household had the right to vote, but it's really impossible to tell from these records how many people actually took advantage of that. African American parents certainly understood the importance of education, and their children were free to attend the local schools. Um, records of district schools in Charlotte, Heinsburg, Bristol, Middlebury, Ferrisburg, and Panton all show that they did, including some from even the poorest families. The Virgin schools would have counted uh, four Storms children among their pupils in 1840 and 1850. And the Panton School, as I said, built on land, leased by S Susanna Storms, would have educated two of her nieces and nephews in 1840 and four in 1860. I wondered if some of these interracial marriages got started in these integrated classrooms um, throughout the county. Now what about the church? The church was an essential center of community life and sociability in New England throughout the 19th century, and Vermont was no uh, exception. Church membership also served as a badge of respectability, um, and it could be a source of mutual aid when needed. 
Um, the African American population was obviously too small to form its own church, but I found that many, many of them belonged to local white churches. Prima Storms and his daughter Susanna joined the ba Panton Baptist Church during a revival in 1807, and the Clarks of Hinesburg were also Baptists. Um, Schubel and Viola were accepted as members in 1815 and had their children baptized at birth. Schubel was also clearly regarded by his fellow churchgoers with respect as he served on numerous church committees. I mean, his daughter and son-in-law, Elmira and William Langley, were also Baptists. They transferred their membership from Rutland when they moved to Hinesburg. African Americans also belonged to um, Addison County's congregational churches. Uh, Philip Storms, his wife Rebecca, their children, his sister, and his sister Pamelia were all baptized in the Regents Congregational Church in the 1830s, as were Rachel Robinson and Mary Ann and Nancy Walters, another um, African American family in Virgins. Andrew Storms was baptized in 1851. Even the Middlebury Baptist Church um, had African American members. Seven were documented in the records from 1806 to 1838, and they were all women. And they included Phoebe Colvin, hope she's not up there anymore, uh, who married Mingo Niles. Okay, now what does all of this mean? Um, for all my complaints about lost and fragmentary records, I, I found a lot of information. I've only given you part of it here. So now I have to stop and consider what does all this mean. Um, the degree to which African Americans were integrated into 19th century community life in Addison County, Shalott and Hinesburg, and by that I mean the school, the church, the town, the sort of the guts of the community was significant, especially when compared with northern cities. I think you'll agree that the evidence gathered here is really unlike um, the separate galleries and churches and other public venues, a legal prohibition against voting and intermarriage, inferior segregated schools, squalid housing, all of the sorts of marks of African American life documented by historians in cities throughout the North. So I have to ask myself what accounts for this difference. Um, before I answer that, I, I want to just say one thing, and that is that I, I don't want to contribute to an old notion of Vermont exceptionalism, one that defines Vermont as more noble, more equality-minded, and fairer um, than the rest of America. I, I think racial attitudes in Vermont covered a broad spectrum, um, with the majority of whites as convinced of black inferiority as, as anyone else. The big difference was the size of the African American population. By keeping white fear at bay, the small size of Vermont's black community seems to have made segregation unnecessary. African Americans in Madison County were not invisible to their white neighbors, but they were too few to raise an alarm. Racial prejudice was the norm, as it was everywhere, but the impulse to act it out in harsh or violent ways was kept in check by the small size of the population. As long as whites felt no serious threat, their need to control their black neighbors was kept in check. In this way, I think the size of African Addison County's African American population was both a blessing and a curse. It was too small to call down the wrath of whites, but it was also too small and really importantly too scattered to create a viable community. Historians have defined a black community as one that was large enough to support a church and some sort of mutual aid society. Now, if all 117 African Americans who lived in Addison County in 1820 had made their homes in Virgins, let's say, they would have been enough to form a church and organize. But their small numbers were scattered through 12 towns that year, leaving many with few or no uh, neighbors of African descent nearby. And although it was spread out, the black population, again, was not evenly dispersed. There were a few what I came to call clusters. They're not communities. Small concentrations made up primarily of one or two extended families, the Clark and Peters families in Hinesburg that Elise has researched, the Freeman and Morocco families in Charlotte and later the Jacksons, the Storms family in Virgins and Penn. Although these clusters persisted through several decades, these family enclaves were not the germ of something larger or permanent. They did not continue to attract new families and grow, but they slowly declined as children and grandchildren moved away. Um, they may have been ephemeral, but they were certainly noticeable to their white neighbors. And this is clear from some of their place names, some of which remain today to remind us of who once lived there. 
The Freeman and Morocco families, for example, lived in a part of Charlotte that was known in the 19th century as Guinea. And if you know Guinea Road that runs through East Charlotte, that's where those people lived. These place names suggest the kind of prejudice that I think black Vermonters faced in the 19th century. Barriers don't have to be legal or official to be effective. And this is where the value of public records breaks down. They tell us that four Storms brothers voted in Virginia's town meeting continuously for 20 years, but they don't tell us if people jeered them when they did. They tell us that Cyrus Dolby had three children in the Middlebury schools, but not whether their classmates welcomed them or shunned them. A stunning example of white prejudice uh, was recorded, oddly enough, in the abolitionist household of the Robinsons at Rugby. Um, Rollin Thomas and Rachel Gilpin Robinson were thoroughgoing Garrisonian radical abolitionists, but none of their four children shared their views. And their second son, George, in particular, adopted the attitudes of his peers and was especially resentful and outspoken. George expressed a sort of a rank and file racism that for him had the extra incentive of spiting his parents, which I think he very much wanted to do. His sentiments were recorded in letters to his absent brother in 1858 and 1859, and they concerned household help hired by his mother. Uh, two white domestic workers had left and been replaced by African Americans, Sarah and Clara, in December of 1858. Now you're going to have to excuse me because I am going to read you George Robinson's letters as he wrote them. So you see, wrote George, the black star is decidedly in the ascendant, whereby the damn niggers are more than ever impressed with the idea that we can't keep house without them. The rest of the family being as firm in the colored persuasion as ever. George bemoaned Sarah's departure in 1859, quote, so we are out of a maid. I suppose the next move will be to get Mary Ann or Francis, unless by chance they find one somewhere that can outstink even them. George Robinson was obsessed with the racist notion common at the time oops, that African Americans smelled badly and more so than whites. In February 1859, he said of Francis, quote, I think her odor improves finely for I can't pass within four feet of her without holding my breath. Familiarity definitely bred contempt for George Robinson, but not so for the neighboring Rogers family. This evidence from, comes from a diary kept by Mary Rogers on an almost daily basis from 1841 to 1848. Unmarried siblings, Mary and Joseph Rogers, lived with their elderly father on their farm in Ferrisburg. Also living in this white household, as she had almost continuously since 1815, was Susanna Storms, Primus and Pamelia Storms' oldest child. Susanna had come, quote, to help mother in 1815 for a time, and then, quote, came to live with us the following year. Susa, as Mary usually refers to her, may have joined the Rogers household originally as a domestic servant, although I, it's not really clear how she came into the household. Um, whatever her arrangement had been with the Rogers family, in 1841, she deeded some of her family's patent land to Joseph, quote, in consideration of a good and con comfortable maintenance during my natural life survival, though this arrangement was retracted before she died, so I don't know what that was about. Mary Rogers' diary is a remarkable document. Sousa Storms figures on nearly every page. And she seemed to be an equal and fully participating member of the household and the community. When she was sick, neighbors came to sit up with her. She frequently visited white neighbors and sat up with them when they were sick. She and Mary Rogers occasionally rode to Virgin's together to shop, to deliver cheese or wool, or to visit. Susanna Storms was not the only person of color welcomed into the Rogers household. Amos Morocco, an African-American farmer then living in Lincoln, stopped for dinner and to stay the night on numerous occasions. The scene Mary Rogers depicted was one of comfortable and natural interaction among neighbors, regardless of race. So which was it? Grudging nasty racism or neighborly acceptance? Well, both. Um, we must also realize that the cross-racial experiences of black and white Vermonters would have been utterly different. Most white residents would have had little or no contact with blacks 
unless they chose to. African Americans, on the other hand, faced unavoidable daily contact with the majority white population in every aspect of their lives. Work, school, church, store, street. And for black Vermonters, these daily interactions no doubt range from friendship to tolerance to hostility. They would have done their best to navigate around the worst of these experiences, but how successful they were is something we'll probably never know. OK, um, one final little bit is what comes next. Um, I don't know, did anybody hear um, Gretchen Grazina on VPR at noon today? She has a new book out on, on Lucy and Abijah Prince. And she said that when she started, she thought she would sort of fool around with this research for about a year and a half. And seven years later, she's got this book out. So um, there's, a lot, there's a lot out there. There's a lot to learn. Um, I think there are many sub-themes interracial marriage, um, the role of women. Um, many of these people were making the transition, particularly in the early period, from slavery to freedom. Uh, the northern states ended slavery uh, just around the time Vermont was really heavily settled. And some of these people were coming into Vermont as free people for the first time. Um, ur more urban areas, Middlebury had no black landowners. I don't know what that means. Would that also have been true in Burlington or Rutland or some of the other more urban, urban areas in Vermont? Um, what I'd like to be able to do is to keep working at this. Um, in fact, I think I'm going to go to Rutland next. Um, a county is a really good, I found the county to be a very good um, uh, area because it's big enough that you can see some trends, you can get some information, but it's small enough to manage. Um, and there's really a lot there to find. So I'm going to stop talking now. <laughs> <laughs>
and he, they're both buried together in the, on the New Haven um, um, Munger Street Cemetery. So, right in front. So, yeah. But, so, I need to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes! Everybody pick on me about this before you leave. The Essex and New York comment is interesting because the Abenaki and the Mohawk people who are living here as well, uh, one family I know from up north, said we travel back and forth according to, you know, because of, t for two reasons, family, but also because it, after every war and after every conflict in the white world, things got tough. So after the War of 1812, and after the Civil War and, and, and all, and so whichever side of the lake was better for us, we lived over there for a while. So, you know, when you're doing research, you have to consider that the lake is a road. Yeah, no, there's, there's connections tons, to New York. Tons of connections. Yes. <coughs> uh, a flock of questions comes to mind, but um, so it, it appears they, they left. Um, and so my, what comes to mind really is, well, were there people who s stayed? And if not, where did they go? And is there any primary resource that says why they left? I mean, we can imagine, but. Right. Um, some of the Peterses are still in Vermont, right, Elise? Um, the, I, I went to 1860, and, and I, another piece of research, I mean, I just wanted to sort of do this county thing. Um, and I would actually like to do the whole state and then have it on a database so we could go in with these other questions. The storms is, are, are logical. I mean, I, you know, you could do a book on the storms. Is. Um, and I started to look a little bit there, you know, the grandchildren started to disappear. The children of Primus and Pamele were all there in Virgins and Panton, and then their children married and they started to, to drift off. Um, and they also start to become white. That's the other thing that happens. They, um, John Storms, um, the mentally deficient John Storms, he married an Irish immigrant named Mary uh, Kelly, and their son uh, was always identified as white. He was identified as white as an infant, and when he was 16, he was working as a farm laborer over in Warren Waitsfield, and he was identified as white. I saw him there. His name is Primus Storms. And he's white, and I'm going, okay, <laughs> this has got to be one of my people. So um, I, that's more work. I, you know, and why, if, you know, economics, most likely, I mean, would be my guess. And then the only other question that, that I wanted to ask now is um, the way I see the certain patterns in, in um, certain towns, it looks like Lincoln, all of a sudden, the whole the population kind of spikes. Uh, yeah, is that is that Quaker related? No, um, it's really interesting because you're dealing with such small numbers and such small groups. That's the Morocco family. When the Moroccos <laughs> they moved to Bristol, look at Bristol in the next census. Rhoda Morocco had a, had an entourage. Um, she had 16 people. She had two entire families, four orphan children, and an infant living in her household in Bristol in 1860. This is some of the stuff I cut out. <laughs> so it doesn't take much. I mean, you know, one family moves and whoop, now there's nobody in town. And there were jobs in Lincoln, too. They lived down. They didn't live up in Lincoln. They lived further, further down. Were there were no jobs. Yes. Was there any uh, connection between these these uh, resident Vermonters, uh, African American Vermonters, and the uh, uh, assistance with the uh, Underground Railroad? Um, that's a very good question. I don't certainly didn't come across any. Um, I've I've now that I know these names. This is the other thing that's good about it. I now like I I have most of these names in my head. So if, if I'm reading anything, if I see one of them, and I'm now thinking I want to go back to some of the um, uh, Vermont Anti-Slavery Society annual reports and see if I see any of their names in attendance at any of these meetings. I have no sense that there was a connection, but I don't know where I would get it from. Um, the thing about Addison County, I didn't say this tonight, and I, and I, don't, I don't know if I want to say it, but I will. Um, I don't know if Addison County is, is an oddball in the state. 
Um, before 1845 or so, it was odd in a number of ways. One, it was the center of the merino wool economy. Two, it was the center of Quakerism. Three, it was the center of anti-slavery. And I don't know if that, I, mean, I don't know if I go to another county, I'm going to find many fewer people, worse treatment. I mean, I've just done this one bit, so I don't know if this is typical. Um, uh, listening to Gretchen Grazina today talking about the, the princes, Abijan and Lucy Terry Prince, um, they had a similar uh, situation to the one that um, Jeffrey Brace talks about in The Blind African Slave, which is they had some better land than their neighbor, and their neighbor tried to cheat them out of it. Now, I didn't come across anything like that, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. But they, those were both, both of those incidents were in southern Vermont, further south in the state. Okay. So, Yes? I'm sorry, if one farmer has better land, the neighbor will always try to cheat. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess. <laughs> yes, but um, you, might, you might have better. Actually, they didn't get away. The princes were able to defend themselves. Uh, the, the braces sold out. The braces couldn't stand it anymore. Jeffrey Brace sold his land to the neighbor, and his neighbor and moved. It happened on Lincoln Hill, too. It did. Uh, the Lay William Langley took his, his neighbor to court. I have all the court records. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. He won. Yeah, he won. He prevailed and kept his land. Yeah, going into those court records to see if, if the black people who went to court were able to, to prevail would be Jerry. Well, one thing I would suggest that it helped integrate blacks, and I, and I don't know that this is true, but own, land ownership is kind of a badge of, of a, I don't want to say acceptability, a badge of being part of the community. Mm -hmm. And the simple fact that they did own land would suggest that they were more, would become simply more acceptable to the community than somebody who was a laborer and didn't own anything. Right. The other thing is that by the time that the Civil War, just before the Civil War, railroads are pretty efficient in Vermont. And you can cross Vermont in a day, all, any, north to south in a day. Talk about and there is evidence that black slaves were riding openly in coaches uh, through the state. Whether they would stop or whether they go through the whole state, we don't know, but you periodically pick up a little news item somewhere in a newspaper that said a black person was on the train. Yes. Do you know, uh, were they all escaped slaves, the ones that came, that showed up all of a sudden? Um, no. I don't, I don't think they were. I mean, I asked that question because so many of their names are, looks like names that were invented when they were North, Prince, King, Freeman. No, I a lot of princes, a lot yeah, of those, those are slave names. Prince is a slave name. It is. Yeah. In Violet, in Violet. What? What? In Violet, women were named as Um I, I think a lot of these people, particularly in the earlier period, were um, and this is another thing that we, we deal with a lot of rugby. Um, the North was not settled by former Southern slaves. It was settled by former Northern slaves. These were slaves from Connecticut. These were slaves from Massachusetts. The, uh, the Stormses were enslaved in New York. If you look at the Fishkill 1790 census, there's Platt Rogers with five slaves. That's Primus and Pamelia and three of their children. He moves to Vermont. They become free. And that how that exactly happened, there's a lot of lore about, you know, he put in his will that they were going to be free. But in fact, under the Vermont Constitution, adult slavery was, was banned. So he must have known that coming into the state. Um, so some people, Jeffrey Brace, I mean, some people were clearly had been enslaved, had received their freedom through legal means or by serving in the Revolutionary War. Revolutionary War veterans, that's another, a lot of Revolutionary War veterans, blacks, that came into Vermont. That's another whole group that could be studied. Um, so some of them, and then that's a very interesting thing to me, they were making that transition. They didn't stay. Most, most of them stay in the port cities, which is where the black population in the north was concentrated. Boston, New Haven, even Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, and there wasn't a lot of, um, incentive for them to come to Vermont unless they wanted to acquire land and farm because there were no jobs of the sorts they held in those cities. But there was that transition taking place right at the time that Vermont was being settled. So Vermont wasn't the only state that forbid slavery. 
the well, the others all eventually, yeah. They, they, it was 1783 or four in Massachusetts. It was later in Connecticut and Rhode Island. Um, but early 1800s, a lot. Yeah. Bruce. Um, I'm just interested in your reasoning about why you want to go to Rutland next, next? instead of moving up further Rutland? north into Tiffin County and um, Burlington. Because a lot of my people move back and forth, people that I know already. I can tell you there's another family. I, I also have this idea of a book about like the great black families of Vermont. The, 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 at least there's people in Hinesburg. The Storms is, there's a family named Prince. Um, there's a street name for them in St. Albans. That's where their uh, people think of the princes as being from St. Albans. The Braces definitely are from St. Albans. But I ran into princes all over. And the Freemans also. And Freeman is an impossible name because it was common, and I'm not sure they were all related. But I think there were these families that um, they were they were the extended families, and they were you can find them, and a lot of them, some of them were in, in Rutland. So I want to go there next. I don't know which one it is, but in the 18 census, 1880 census, one of the the first thing that got me interested in the blacks in Hinesburg, in the 1880 census, one of the mother-in-laws of one of the families up in Hinesburg was born in Vermont, and if you calculate how old she is in 1880, and, and her parents supposedly, according to the census, were born in Vermont, she's born like 1830. And if her parents were here then, that means, if her parents were born here, that means they had to be born about the time of the Revolutionary War. It, it's, yeah, it, that's possible. If that's really true. Right, and it's also possible they weren't born in Vermont. Yeah. And sometimes you see just Vermont, Vermont, Vermont. You could yeah. tell the guy, it's just put in Vermont. He isn't really paying any attention or even asking the question. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, it's hard to know for sure. Yeah. If they were here that early, yes. they'd be born here. Yes. Anybody else? Well, I, I brought a photograph I thought you might be interested Ooh. in. My um, grandmother was born on the Basin Harbor Road. She was in Allen. And I have this really old picture. It would be my three great-grandfather's farm, the Allen farm. And there is a black man in it. Oh, my God. And <laughs> <laughs> I thought I would bring it. And the house still stands. This is the same house. I know that house. My grandmother was born in this for the fetch form. I thought of But um, it's always been a mystery to me who that was. Does he have a big white beard? It looks like he's got a white beard. Amazing. Well, <laughs> I mean, if. You know, that's where the storms have slept. In, in that general area. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to think if there were any other black families in um, that area besides the storms. I don't think there were. They were just, um, wow, just people who were facing for everything. And the farm is on the way. See, um, I also brought tonight, and I'm not going to get them out, I brought a, a carousel with some slides because this is my first. PowerPoint. <laughs> um, I have um, um, physical slides that I don't know how to turn into this yet. I have to figure that out. Um, the the storms are buried at Basin Harbor. Do you know where? Um, My grandmother's people are all buried no, no, at that they're little they're tiny cemetery behind the beach house. Yeah, the yeah, Allens. Okay. Primus uh, Primus is there. Primus storms was 107 when he died in 1842. So, oh my this is just a little tragedy of life in this field. I, I thought, oh, he was 107. He was a local character. There's going to be an obituary of him in the Virgins for a marker. <laughs> he died on May 23, 1842. So here I am in the Bixby, aging through, aging through. The last one they have is May 11th. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so he's there, his wife Pamelia is there, his daughter Pamelia is there, even though she had married uh, Louis Langley and moved to Hinesburg, and their daughter Susanna is there. So they're, and they're right next to the Rogerses, in whose household they were enslaved when they lived in New York. All right up. Oh my gosh. <laughs>
and there were a lot of them. I mean, they had eight children, and uh, five of them married and had more children. And so that, we knew, well, that's for Jens now, but you, oh, that whole area, they were, that's where they were. Mm. I'm going to get your name before you leave. Yeah, it's just such a mystery to me that he was maybe working on the farm. And yeah. Um, everyone is gone, you know, that could ever tell me anything. <laughs> and I never saw this picture while my grandmother was living, so she might have been able to tell me something. Yeah, it's too bad. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.